Hi, I'm Talum in Milan. I was listening. Music is about listening, first and foremost. Um, <clears throat> I don't know, uh, I really, I don't know what music is. I mean, I, I, you could say organized uh, sound by humans, or uh, it's uh, in the ear of the beholder. Music is in the ear of the beholder. Um, <clears throat> I mean, it is, uh, it is something that we, uh, it's a term that we use to differentiate certain types of sounds from other types of sounds. So in a certain way, it's kind of prejudiced already, the term music. I mean, all terminology is helpful to a certain degree. And then it's also at some point obfuscates the reality. Um, I mean, I just played a concert of music right now, but I also hear music around me everywhere at every moment in time. For me, it, the concert really doesn't begin or end. It's like all a continuation from, from the Big Bang or before that, <laughs> whatever it was. But obviously it's, it is something that I'm very uh, invested in and have been my entire life. And so it's something that I care very much about, even if I can't necessarily define what it is. But it's, it's a sound and it's listening. I make music for people to listen and to help focus uh, the sense of listening. Music is one of those things that we all know when we hear it. And it's also a deep connection with the source of all existence. Is um, how we communicate information throughout generations across uh, geopolitical divides and borders. It's a way to connect with others intimately and immediately without words being spoken. It's um, one of the funnest things for me to do. Is necessary. Well, uh, <clears throat> we are receptors, mm -hmm. right? Um, we have uh, these uh, um, two things we call ears on either side of our heads, and uh, and they have these uh, grooves in them and these little hairs and and uh, this apparatus that goes into our, our brains um, that processes uh, uh, the, what we're receiving, energy that we're receiving as sound. Um, then listening has different layers to it. I mean, we're always hearing. So there's a, a the passive aspect of listening and there's the active aspect of listening. We can't turn our listening off. We can only turn our attention to the sound off. And not even always that, obviously, sometimes we can't. Right? Um, there's certain types of sound that, that, that draws us in, that wakes us up to our, sen our sense of listening. That's what I'm interested in participating in. Um, and that happens in a lot of different ways. Uh, being attractive, making sound that's attractive to people to, to oh, I like this. I want to, not that I'm playing, not that I know what people like, <laughs> but I just mean that participating in this idea of, of creating sound that um, encourages people to be aware of that sense. I think that sensuality is a very important part of uh, being alive, of being um, uh, integrated in the world, um, of empathy with others. 
everybody can experience sensuality in some way or another. It's also an acculturation. There's, um, but when we're in touch with our senses and the sensuality, we don't need other things so much. We don't need to accumulate objects and possessions. We don't need to possess other people. We don't need to be dominant or to be powerful or rich or, because we have so much already through our senses and sensuality. We're very rich in these regards. My upbringing was full of music, many, many different types of music and many people who were playing music. And, uh, my mom was a piano teacher and my, my dad was, he wasn't around very much. He was kind of mythological to me. And he played uh, and sang in piano bars, uh, playing golden era music, Jerome Kern and so on. Um, one of my first memories playing music was climbing up inside of my mom's grand piano and uh, playing the strings. That when I, so when, when I get inside the piano, it's like going home in a way. I know people think of it as adventurous music, uh, but it really is the place for me where sound and play, uh, which we generally call improvisation, uh, all started. It's where I feel most comfortable as a human being <laughs> inside of piano. <laughs> But when I think about influences, I think about everything from being in the womb, and birth, birth canal, the first time when your ears hear the world outside of your, your mother's womb, um, uh, the, the first human voices that you hear, uh, machines beeping, um, the type of energy that is in that space in that moment in time. And then uh, eventually the concept of, of death and uh, that everything eventually disappears, coming to grips with that. These are the things that influence me as an artist. When I think specifically about music, the first that comes to mind is my mom as a, a piano teacher, particularly classical music. And then also my dad, who, like I said, is kind of this mythological creature. He wasn't there very much, but uh, when he was, he was singing these old songs and that had a big impact on me. I, uh, my mom was very um, encouraging to me to explore sound and um, of all kinds. I mean, she was very, she was very strict uh, that I had to study the piano and uh, I practiced every day for years uh, until I eventually it became mine. And when I was about 12 years old, I realized that I had ideas. <clears throat> I had so many ideas and I had the facility and knowledge and experience to be able to facilitate and realize these ideas. But I uh, also heard all kinds of music growing up in the San Francisco Bay Area which was full of many, many, many communities from all over the world. Um, and uh, that's definitely a very important part of it all for me. Uh, and certainly growing up on the West Coast with uh, Lou Harrison, I actually knew him when I was a child and later on in life. Played his gamelan ensemble at San Jose State University. Terry Riley and Kronos Quartet, um, these were regular happenings for me growing up, uh, going to the San Jose Symphony, going to Kumbwa Jazz Club in Santa Cruz, which was a legendary jazz club there. Uh, and a West Coast punk rock. In the 80s, that was, a, that was a very important moment in time. And I was, I was a teenager then, so that was definitely an important part of it. So San Jose Symphony to the Dead Kennedys. As of the last year, I've been saying I'm a keyless. I don't own a key to anything now. 
for quite a while, I owned a key to a van and trucks and cars before that. And, but now it's all uh, primarily the travel is through mass transit, public transit of different kinds. Fortunately in Europe, through trains, most of the touring is through trains. It's been um, 14 years now that Angel and I have been traveling consistently without our own home. And, but we like to say that we have many homes at the same time. We've been spending the last 10 days with Andrea Caprada and his family in Bologna. It's the drummer of my band, Zigotti. Um, and I give a lot of workshops. So, I mean, we, multi, like multi-day workshops, we spend time in communities. It's not just constant move, move, move. But it gives us the opportunity to really be able to participate in communities, uh, collaborate with lots of musicians, document what people are doing. And, uh, I guess I'll start by saying, yeah, it's different than being on a normal kind of a tour, which is, you know, normally when when musicians or ensembles or bands tour, you want to make it as dense as possible and to play every night in a different town. And I do that sometimes. And then I also have periods that um, where I'm able to spend time in communities. I give a lot of workshops. And uh, so through the workshops, it draws people together. Sometimes people in a community that didn't even know each other before. And through that, they, they uh, gain, develop relationships that last much longer. And, and then I'm able to return and continue the work again in the next year or so. Um, It's a philosophically quite different because I don't go back. Really, I mean, I return to places, but it's always moving forward. There's a difference when you go out on a trip or a vacation or a tour, and you know that there's a certain date that you're going to return back home. Mm -hmm. And um, and I've had this experience too. Of course, there's like a a certain kind of a, a peak that happens in that time, and then there's the anticipation of returning back home. Well, I never have that anticipation, right? It is not, it's, um, I mean, tomorrow I'm going to Amsterdam, which I've been to two or three times in the past year. Um, but it's not my home. I don't have possessions there. I have no particular responsibilities to any particular place. I don't have things that I have to think about. Um, and then, so then the whole relationship with the idea of what is home is uh, important uh, to me. And I think all of this uh, informs my work as an artist, for sure. Also being constantly in motion is really important for me. It just feels like it keeps all my juices flowing, you know, all my creative juices flowing. Um, and yes, being uh, in different cultures, different languages, different foods, different smells, different sounds uh, is always keeping me awake. You know, when you're, when you're away from home or in unfamiliar surroundings, you really have to be much more awake. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, and this is not to, you know, talk bad about anybody in, in any way whatsoever, but if you're in a routine and you're going to work each day at the same place and and you have the same commute and the same kinds of routines and so on, um, it is easier to go through life habitually. But when you're in places where you really don't know exactly what's around the corner there and you don't know, there's so much you don't know, <laughs> you have to be awake. You have to be. And you want to be because everything's new and exciting, you know, and so. Um, yeah, and the, the concept of, of home, I, I was on a panel discussion with some other artists in Mexico City many years ago, mm -hmm. and that was a pretty fascinating conversation. Uh, these were all artists that, um, they all had homes, but they spent a lot of time in other places, and um, how, how do you define it, you know? And I, the way I feel is that I'm home everywhere. I mean, I'm home here. 
And then eventually I won't have here this anymore. And so I'll be home in the sea of energy of the universe somehow, which is where I am now, right? Always. So, uh, and I think that's important not to make that kind of a distinction between here's home and everywhere isn't. The more that you find yourself at home everywhere, I think the better. I think it's the same as it's always been, um, which is uh, to continue to wake us up to the reality of life, um, to uh, our relationships with each other, and as well to other species and the planet and the universe and all the dynamics and quantum physics. <laughs> um, I think that I participate in, uh, in musical forms that come out of uh, traditions of revolution, revolutionary musics. And they are, uh, have always been musics that um, re are in response to their time, um, aware of uh, the dynamics and the needs in the moment of, uh, of our communities, uh, both uh, small and large. And for me, the, 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 the best way to uh, honor the, these traditions is to, to uh, live in my moment and to respond uh, to the dynamics of the world that are happening now. I do think that art and music uh, do play an important role in the health of individuals and the health of society in a lot of, a lot of different ways. And so, uh, yeah, uh, to me, it's, it's important to hear a sense of urgency in, in an artist's work. Um, otherwise, I, it's kind of boring to me, mm -hmm. <laughs> even if it's, you know, um, great in many other ways. But I really need to hear urgency in music. It's uh, fundamentally important to me. I think we also mentioned like danger, dangerous and challenging and yeah. um, People listen to music for so many different reasons, and, and all of those are perfectly valid. Um, music also has the opportunity to challenge us in a variety of ways, and this is the most compelling aspect of, of music, organized sound, uh, for me. This was uh, three different recordings, all recorded in Italy last fall, and um, it's Two, there's four large uh, long tracks. Um, two of them are acoustic piano and two of them are electric with the wave state that I'm traveling with now. And in many ways, it's kind of a culmination of, uh, of my life's work, I would say. And it's, for me, it's interesting. I've been a pianist all my life, dedicated to acoustic piano. And to have an album now that has both solo piano and solo electric, it just, it's kind of like, you know, it's one of those albums where you feel like, okay, I could die now. I did. There it is. Here's all my, my work. If anybody wants to know what do I do as a soloist, it's there. So from that standpoint, it's very satisfying. Um, the, uh, the idea of obstacle illusion, um, actually, it's a play on words because uh, in English we say optical illusion, right? When something does, looks different than it really is. And... Um, and I think that in this case, that we have many obstacles that are really illusions. And um, when we recognize that we have more, uh, that we're more empowered than we think we are, that uh, this, we could change the world, I think, you know. I don't mean to sound Pollyannish, but at least I can change myself and um, for the better, and therefore I can have better more enriching interactions with others in those ways. Um, but it's a philosophical concept. And I think it's great album. Thank you.